Hello and welcome to part 2 of the AS Water Shader setup. In this part we will learn how to set up your own flow map, go over each channel utilized by the flow map and finally applying this flow map to our shader. Alright, let's get started. First we will open the already existing flow map in Photoshop. We do this in order to observe the channels that exist and are utilized by the shader. One note before and though, Photoshop cannot natively read a PNG files of a channel. It will apply the channel as a per pixel transparency value. This is a problem since the shader is dependent on its alpha channel for time blending and uses a paint own flow maps need to be able to access the channel in order to create its custom noise map. Luckily, there exists a plugin for this. The plugin is called SuperPNG from the awesome people at fnordware.com. I have provided a direct link to the download page within the open source folder. You can simply download this plugin and install it directly into Photoshop. What this enables users to do is import the PNG and instead of applying a per pixel transparency, import this transparency as a separate alpha channel. So let's do this. The flow map that is used by the shader and which is outputted by the renderer contains four channels, red, green, blue, and alpha. The red and green channels both contain all the vector information for the flow map. This controls how the water will be flowing. The blue channel will contain the height map data, which controls how visible the waves are. So even if you have a very strong normal map, 50% or below gray will make sure the water is flat. The alpha channel contains a noise map, which will spread out the time blending over several parts with an offset based on the value of the noise. This will make sure there is no visible blending anywhere. So let's go to the renderer itself and create our own flow map. There's two things you have to do before you can render. Every non-standard shaped object needs to have a mesh collider in order to trace its faces correctly or its vector direction. Standard shapes can use the box collider or the sphere collider, but if you want to be sure, putting a mesh collider on everything is the safest thing to do to get a correct render. After the render is done, you can simply remove or disable these colliders. In order to be able to generate a flow map, you need to apply the flow map generator to the surface. Select your water surface, add component, and add the flow map generator to it. Once you have added a generator to your surface, we can take a look at its settings. By default, you will have an 8x8 grid, which is spread along the surface of your water. Let's amp that up to 128, 128. Keep in mind that debugging is enabled by default. If you go any higher than 128, I recommend disabling this setting in order to not get any lag. Let's have a look at the settings. We can set our own surface to a power of 2, since all textures are also rendered in a power of 2. So if my, for instance, my X value is not a power of 2, I can click this button and the closest power of 2 will be set. In this case, I want to have a square, so I'll keep it at 512. Now let's have a look at the first sections. The input size setting creates a texture in memory of the dimensions given here. So now a texture of 128 by 128 will be created. Later, after all the rendering is done, we can upscale this to a higher map value. The reason why we render at the input size is simply to have a faster rendering process. At the moment, we can see all the sample points, but as you might notice, there's still a lot of gaps in between. What will happen now is that the input size will output a one-dimensional pixel array Iterate through it based on each sample point and the sample points will sample right below it and gather its flow vector data, height map data and noise information. In order to have more higher and corrected detail we might want to increase this value. For instance to 512, let's disable debug. Mostly I have an output size of 4k. This way we have a little bit of natural blurring while upscaling and let's give our texture a name. In this case I'm going to simply take the name of my surface so that's for the input and output settings. So we have an input of 512, 512, which will be rendered out. It will be upscaled to 4K and it will be saved to a PG file called Waterplane Large 2 onto the render settings. For lower end PCs, it might be more interesting to use a lower input size, but render in multiple passes. Even at higher input sizes, rendering in multiple passes will always benefit a more accurate result. So in this case, I want to render four passes. I'm going to lower the input size real quick because I still want to show you something. Like I said before, there's still gaps within our detail. For instance, when rendering this area out, we will miss four units of detail around each sample point. So if we increase the pass randomizer size, or let's say one unit, maybe even four units, each sample point will start moving around. Now, the debug will show this on a per frame basis, but during the rendering, it will render on a per pass basis. So the more passes you have, 
The more different sample areas you will get, aka a more accurate result you will get. So if you have 10 passes, 128 grid, it will get pretty busy. Let's disable the debugging. Then we can set the ray offset. The ray offset determines the distance from your water surface into the y axis. I have set this to 100 because I want to have every single angle surface of the mountains in my render. The higher this value is, the more intense your flow map will be. So in this case, we have to load the ray boost value. A ray boost value of 1 will output a current pixel's exact value. This value is amplified by the ray offset y. Since we're 100 meters up in the air to get every single object in the render, we have to load this a bit. So let's go with 0.01. Our spectral radius, uh, we can leave this at 0. What this basically does is if you have no render pass at all, it will sample the neighbor pixel in order to get an average value. So it is still a bit more detail for each pixel. Since we're sampling the 10 passes with our randomization, we do not need to offset our pixel radius. The noise scale, let's put that at 6, is basically just the, the noise that will be filled in the alpha channel. And now the two most important things is the water and the object layer. In the water layer, you will select the layer on which your water surface is located. On the object layer, you will select most of the time everything except for the water layer. So you can have your water surface on different layers, just make sure that the layer is included in the water layer dropdown and is excluded from the object layer dropdown. You can apply some post-processing, uh, some blurring, but since we're opening our image in Photoshop afterwards, we can apply the blurring there. Uh, should you decide to use blurring, I recommend starting with uh, a blur radius of 2 over 6 iterations. On to the last part of the renderer, we have 3 different render modes. You can hover over it to get tooltip. The pixel mode will only update one pixel at a time. It's the slowest in performance and has the longest render time, but it will never freeze up unity. The row update mode will render the texture per row, which means in this case it will render 128 pixels in one go and it does us 128 time for each line there is in the texture. This is the intermediate speed. Uh, depending on the size, it can either be a long run of time or a short run of time. My favorite one is pass mode, with, which will update the texture in one go. Small texture sizes uh, up to 512 will only take about a second. Higher texture sizes, if, if we will sample this at 4K, for instance, might take a minute to render. Keep in mind, since this updates a complete pass in one go, the engine might appear frozen. But don't worry, just wait until the render is completed depending on your cpu performance this can take a long time or a short time so in this case we have 10 passes with an input size of 128 by 128 besides the update modes you also have two render types for each update mode on all three they consist of a grid render and a uv ray trace render what's the difference between the two basically the grid render is the fastest of the two of them the grid renderer expects the surface to have a square uv layout the ray trace renderer does not care about that. It will simply trace a ray across the water surface, sample the UV of that pixel location, trace another ray from there to get the surface flow vectors below it. The ray trace render might be twice all the way up to four times slower than a grid render. So I do not recommend the UV ray trace render for large textures, only for small ones. I myself most of the time use grid renderer as most areas I use use square planes. So let's click on render. There we go, 10 passes have been done. Let's check out the result. As you can see, we now have a flow map with alpha data. We can see the flow information in there. Let's open this in Photoshop to double check it. And the flow map is done. Let's apply this flow map to our water surface. Importantly, let's prepare the texture. Since we are not using the texture as color information, we can disable sRGB because we want the full range information of the texture. Wrap mode can be either repeat or clamp, it does not really matter that much. Let's use the full import scale, bilinear filtering and no compression at this moment. Let's select the water surface and drag the flow map in the flow map slot. Now we only rendered the 128 by 128, so details of course will go lost. So let's try rendering a higher resolution image. In pass mode. If you have time, always use pass mode if you do not need to work in the engine directly. Keep in mind if you're updating 1024 pixels in Wone mode, uh, depending on your CPU, Unity might still stutter, so you might have to fall back to pixel mode. But most of the time, the render time of pixel mode, even for low resolution images, can take up up to 50 minutes, and it might even be more useful to just wait a few seconds for the pass mode to finish. There's no quality difference between the three modes, only a time and behavior difference. Okay, so we have now a render with more detail. 
I would try to use a grid runner as much as possible. Just prepare your UV layout to fit within a square UV space and you should be good to go. Let's apply this render real quick to the surface. As you can see, now we were starting to get very distinguished flow patterns. In previous tutorial, I showed you the debug mode, so let's enable this in order to see the flow vectors. Debugging your flow map so you know what's going on has three modes. Minus one enables height map mode, which shows you the height map that is rendered. Zero shows you the flow map and one shows you the combined normal output. If you follow along, you should be able to set up the renderer and render your own flow maps. You of course can always paint your own flow maps or use third party software such as Houdini to render your flow map. You just need to make sure that the four channel setup of the texture is the same. You still have to add a blue channel and a noise map in the alpha channel. If you do not want to use a height map per se, you can simply fill the blue channel with white and you should be good to go. That's about it. I hope this two part series of any use to you. I'm excited to see what kind of water you guys can make. Bye.